Energy and Natural Resource Committee will discuss the growing opportunities for hydrogen in our clean energy future. Clean hydrogen is a game-changing fuel that we can produce right here at home from our abundant resources and use it to decarbonize different sectors of the economy while supporting the energy independence. So I'm very excited for this conversation today and to hear from our witnesses who are experts in their field. I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, this is a topic that has received a lot of attention from committee members from both sides of the aisle, and I know many of you are interested in the opportunities for hydrogen in your home states, and for good reason. As I said, clean hydrogen is a versatile fuel that has the potential to significantly decarbonize many sectors of our economy, including the power, transportation, and industrial sectors. We've made a lot of progress decarbonizing the power sectors, but the transportation and industrial sectors are much harder, and clean hydrogen could be integral to getting at those parts of our economy. Now, when I say clean, I'm talking about all of the energy feedstocks and technologies that can be used to produce hydrogen, including fossil fuels, nuclear, and renewable energy. With advancements in technologies like carbon capture for fossil and electro uh, electrolysis, using electricity, we can ensure hydrogen is produced from all of these domestic sources in the cleanest way possible with low or zero carbon emissions. Our industrial sector uses energy intensive processes that today mostly rely on energy intensive fossil fuels. But hydrogen can also deliver the heat required for these processes and has already been put to the test in refining and chemical plants. And with industrial sources contributing about 23% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, Clean hydrogen can help companies tackle the challenges of addressing their thermal and electrical energy needs while also serving as a potential feedstock. I also believe that we must look for ways to clean up our transportation sector in an efficient way, given that it is responsible for the largest amount of greenhouse gas emissions in this country. We should seriously be considering the potential of hydrogen use in vehicles and other modes of transport, like shipping and aviation, and it's easy to see why there's a lot of enthusiasm for hydrogen. Clean hydrogen can be used to decarbonize intense sectors, promote domestic economy prosperity, and maintain energy security. However, we have some challenges to tackle in order to build a clean hydrogen economy. Producing hydrogen without emissions is two to six times the cost of current production methods. Also, retrofitting end-use applications to use hydrogen as a feedstock from chemical plants to cars and trucks will take huge investments from both the public and private sectors. This is the demand that we need to develop hydrogen markets that can sustain themselves. The other big challenge is the safe and efficient transport and storage of large volumes of hydrogen given its physical properties. There is a lot of promising work being done in this space and will allow us to leverage our vast natural gas pipeline network to transport hydrogen to market. I know we will hear about some of these efforts today. As with many emerging technologies, we need to invest in the entire hydrogen value chain to bring down the cost and overcome deployment barriers. That is why I made research, development, and demonstration of these technologies a central part of the Energy Infrastructure Act, which this committee reported with bipartisan support last year and which was subsequently included in the recently enacted bipartisan infrastructure law. In that bill, we fund $9.5 billion in research development and demonstration of clean hydrogen. And we tasked the Department of Energy to develop a national strategy and a roadmap to get us to a clean hydrogen economy. This includes $8 billion for hubs across the country to accelerate hydrogen production from all energy sources and facilitate its delivery and utilization across all sectors of our economy. This is an all of the above fuel that can be made with whatever resource you have on hand. For example, we sit on an ocean of gas in West Virginia, along with the growth of renewables, and as, this, and as of this week, the ban on nuclear power has just been repealed in West Virginia. That's good news. We are also in close proximity to hydrogen end-use applications, including power plants, refineries. So we are well positioned for one of these hydrogen hubs, just like most of our uh, co committee uh, caucuses in, on both sides of the aisle. I look forward to seeing the DOE get the hydrogen hub selection process underway. we got to get moving. The bill also includes $1 billion for research and development to bring down the cost of electro electrolysis, allowing for cost-competitive hydrogen production from electricity. We align with this investment to ensure the Department of Energy has the resources needed to meet the goal of driving down the cost of clean hydrogen by 80% within the decade. 
And we invested another $500 million in a manufacturing and recycling program to ensure that we can develop these technologies here and support the domestic supply chains that are needed to advance a clean hydrogen economy. More will need to be done in the future, but these investments are a down payment to innovating, not eliminating our way to a cleaner climate. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses on these topics and how we can take advantage of this exciting technology to power our future. With that, I'm going to turn to Senator Langford for his opening remarks. Chair Manchin, thank you. Thanks for holding this hearing as well. Uh, the future of hydrogen energy is exceptionally important for us to be able to address here and to be able to talk through it. I am uh, honored to be able to sit in for uh, Ranking Member Barrasso and, uh, and join you and our family praying for Bobby and uh, for her quick recovery. Hydrogen is one of the simplest and most commonly occurring elements on Earth. The reason we're here discussing it today is it burns cleanly, with the byproducts being heat and water. Hydrogen has many potential uses. One of the most talked about possible uses for hydrogen is in the transportation sector and as a power, especially for heavy trucks. NASA has been using hydrogen fuel since the 1950s to power rockets into space. It's, uh, they were one of the first to use hydrogen fuel cells to support electrical system on spacecraft. It's time that we learn from their experience and their applied lessons to solve transportation and heavy industry challenges here on Earth. Despite the promise of hydrogen, there are some challenges in unleashing its potential. Hydrogen has to be freed from compounds it commonly occurs in, like water, H2O, and methane, CH4, to get it into a state where it can be used as an energy source. The process to separate the elements requires significant power itself. The process to uh, continue this process, whether we put it into a liquid form, requires a tremendous amount of power to be able to keep it that cold. Hydrogen also doesn't produce as many BTUs as methane does. But beyond production challenges, there are many logistical questions that need to be answered as to the use of this technology and how it grows. One such question is how to best transport hydrogen from where it's produced to where it'll be used. Our existing natural gas pipeline networks holds promise for transporting and delivering hydrogen across the country and provides an incredible example of how we can leverage existing infrastructure to meet the future needs rather than starting from scratch. But the natural gas pipeline uh, infrastructure has developed over decades. To have this kind of infrastructure available for future hydrogen, we need to make investments now. Unfortunately, investment in natural gas pipelines all too frequently is met with opposition, despite natural gas playing a key role in lowering emissions, despite the critical roles pipelines may play in empowering a broad adoption of low and no emission hydrogen. Their efforts are already, already underway to grapple with how to best produce and deploy this resource of hydrogen. I'm particularly proud of my home state of Oklahoma's efforts to grow the hydrogen industry. In the spirit of its long hin history of being an energy leader and having a very diverse energy economy, my state put together a task force to determine how it can use its deep experience in the energy industry to pioneer the hydrogen frontier. The report of the task force is released last year, outlined a roadmap for how we can combine our existing resources like abundant natural gas and renewable power with our energy expertise to grow the hydrogen economy. I'm glad we have witnesses here today who are familiar with this effort, and I'm always glad to be able to see some Oklahomans here as well. Although there are states and regions that have the building blocks for the hydrogen industry, its growth and broad success is far from guaranteed. Government policies, unfortunately, sometimes unfairly or unintentionally prevent technologies that should be winners from floating to the top. I'm concerned about the conversation around green versus blue hydrogen will pit technologies against each other rather than working together to establish a robust hydrogen marketplace. The simple truth right now is 95% of hydrogen produced in the United States is made from natural gas. If our goal is to determine whether hydrogen is a viable alternative to some of our existing energy technologies, we cannot discount a method that could drive the need for and development of other parts of the supply chain. We really need an all the above approach to give this effort the best chance of success, and I'm hoping this is a topic we'll discuss today. Finally, hydrogen provisions in last year's Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, including the $8 billion to stand up regional clean hydrogen hubs, have generated a lot of interest in many states represented on this committee. I look forward to hearing how the Department of Energy plans to spend this funding and how they define a hub. I'm always glad to see all of you here. I'm grateful for the time that you've spent actually writing and preparing for this time period and doing the research, and we look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Senator Langford. I'd like to turn to our panel of witnesses, and we have with us Dr. Sunita Setyapal. I hope I said that close. 
Director of the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technologies Office and the Hydrogen Program Coordinator at the U.S. Department of Energy. Dr. Dr. Glenn Morrell, uh, Executive Director of the Wyoming Energy Authority. Dr. Jonathan Lewis, Senior Counsel and Director of Transportation Decarbonization at the Clean Air Task Force. We have Mr. Michael Graff, Chairman and CEO of American Air Liquide Holdings. And we have Mr. Brian uh, Luvanka. Did I get that correct? Luvanka? Close. I got you. Vice President of New Energy Ventures at Williams Companies. I want to thank you all again for joining us today. And Dr. Seth DuPaul, we'll start with you. And your thank you, Chairman Manchin and uh, Senator Langford, Ranking Member and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sunita Sachipal, and I'm the director for the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Technologies Office at the US Department of Energy, where I direct research, development, demonstration, and deployment activities on hydrogen and fuel cells. And I also serve as the DOE Hydrogen Program Coordinator for multiple offices across DOE involved in hydrogen, including renewables, fossil, nuclear, basic science, and others. This is a historic time for hydrogen and a unique opportunity for the United States. With 18 years at DOE and previously an industry dedicated to advancing hydrogen and fuel cells, I am honored to serve the nation to the best of my capacity to accelerate progress in hydrogen technologies. Clean hydrogen is one part of a comprehensive energy strategy to enable clean, secure, and equitable energy, a future for all Americans. I have three points today. First, the status and the opportunity. Hydrogen offers versatility and flexibility, both in terms of production and end use. You can make it from renewables, nuclear, fossil, with carbon capture and sequestration. You can store it as a gas, a liquid, or a chemical carrier, and use it to produce electricity or as a fuel or a feedstock. It can reduce emissions, especially for hard to decarbonize sectors like heavy duty transportation and industry, such as producing fertilizer and steel manufacturing. It can provide reliable power and long duration energy storage to enable resiliency and a renewable grid. DOE funding enabled more than 1,100 US patents, over 30 commercial technologies, and more than 65 that we think could be commercial in the next few years. And today, there are thousands of commercial fuel cells in the market for stationary power and transportation, and over 10 million tons of hydrogen produced in the US, mostly for oil refining and ammonia production. Analysis shows the potential for two to four times more hydrogen demand in the 2040 timeframe, and we continue to assess various scenarios. And industry has projected the potential for 700,000 jobs in the US by 2030 based on market success. My second point is that despite progress, there are still significant challenges, including uh, the lack of, including cost, as well as the lack of a hydrogen infrastructure, the lack of manufacturing at scale, as well as durability and reliability and supply chain issues. We have about 1,600 miles of hydrogen pipeline, but we'll need significantly more. We have three geological caverns for hydrogen storage, but that is insufficient for the scale of hydrogen required. We had about 170 megawatts of electrolyzer capacity as of June of last year, but Europe alone has a 40 gigawatt target by 2030. We must reduce cost and ramp up scale of clean hydrogen production, delivery, storage, end use to achieve the benefits of hydrogen. And finally, third is how are we addressing these challenges? We must remain laser focused and accelerate progress Last June, Secretary Granholm launched the Hydrogen Energy Earthshot with a bold, ambitious goal of $1 for one kilogram of clean hydrogen in one decade, and 80% less than the cost of renewable hydrogen today. And our strategy from research to deployment will help to achieve that goal. So thanks to Congress, the bipartisan infrastructure law and sustained annual appropriations, which includes 400 million in the President's 2022 request, uh, provide a tremendous opportunity for the nation. This will accelerate manufacturing and rollout of hydrogen technologies, 
and enable a competitive, sustainable market and ensure the United States is not just a technology leader in hydrogen, but also a leader in its deployments and use. Now, stakeholder engagement, collaboration, coordination, metrics for success are all key to ensure the most effective, cohesive, and efficient implementation of our programs. I know there's a lot of interest in the hubs, um, so today I am pleased to share that we will soon release two requests for information to solicit feedback on the hydrogen hubs, as well as the electrolyzer and clean hydrogen manufacturing and recycling provisions. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for your interest in hydrogen. I look forward to working with you to decarbonize our economy while ensuring equitable access to low cost, reliable and resilient clean energy. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, doctor. Now we have Dr. Morrell. Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Langford, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on this important topic. Uh, my name is Dr. Glenn Morrell, and I'm the Executive Director of the Wyoming Energy Authority. The Wyoming Energy Authority plays a key role in the strategically positioning the energy economy of the Wyoming for the future. It's one of our missions and mandates. So Chairman, in early 2021, Wyoming adopted an energy strategy focused on moving the state towards an all of the above net zero economy. This strategic ambition is full of opportunities and challenges. Opportunities, obviously, for our rich renewable resources and our nascent nuclear industry in the state, but it's clearly a challenge for our hydrocarbon base, which brings us, of course, to hydrogen. Regardless of the feedstock used, uh, hydrogen can be produced in a manner that uh, it can be either zero or low emissions um, in, in profile. That is uh, obviously very important for Wyoming's net zero goal. And it's clearly obviously important because of the value associated by society and decarbonized energy forms today. But secondly, hydrogen is also extremely flexible and can be transported and consumed in multiple fashions. We can use gas pipelines, liquid pipelines, rail, uh, highway uh, to move it, and it can be used as a residential industrial heat and power, uh, transportation fuel, or industrial feedstock. This flexibility creates multiple opportunities for an energy economy. And an energy economy like Wyoming, we're looking to, use, to go from natural gas to hydrogen, utilize existing pipelines and continue to provide low emissions fuel to large population demand centers where our markets are. We're also looking to use it to co-fire existing thermal fleet and realize an immediate reduction in emissions on our coal and natural gas bur uh, burning turbines. We're also looking to the future and th thinking about how to synthesize net zero fuels and petrochemicals by coupling a hydrogen system with a nascent CO2 management system as well. We're also looking at how we can use it as an alternative storage and transmission method for our renewable base. So it's not just about hydrogen, it's not just about a gas, this is truly a transformative opportunity for an entire energy sector. Shifting gear a little to Wyoming, uh, some analysis shows that Wyoming has something in the order of 25% of the nation's feedstock for hydrogen production, whether it's material or energy based. Uh, we also have abundant infrastructure through the I-80 corridor. We have pipelines, uh, rail, uh, highway, transmission, and others. We're, we're geographically very well located to uh, deliver hydrogen, clean hydrogen, into various markets, either in the Denver metropole or further afield into the West Coast. We also have significant, significant CO2 management infrastructure, and we're one of the only two states with Class VI primacy. These characteristics obviously position well, uh, Wyoming well for hydrogen development, and I'm very proud today to be able to have the privilege to work with companies like Tallgrass Energy, uh, Black Hills Energy on co-firing turbines in the Cheyenne area. Uh, we're working with North Shore Energy in southwest Wyoming, Jonah Energy on synthetic natural gas. We're working with Anschutz Power Company of Wyoming on renewable-based hydrogen, and we're working with my co-panelist here from Williams Companies on their plans for hydrogen in the state as well. We're also working with our neighboring states, recognizing a shared vision and a clear potential for development of hydrogen hub and infrastructure in the region. Bringing up hubs again, the 2021 Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act contains dozens of programs that are beneficial for Wyoming, and obviously the, the most pertinent one today is a clean, in, a clean hydrogen hub program. Given the previous characteristics I just mentioned, it is clear that Wyoming should be considered a good candidate for, such a, for the location of one of these hubs, and we certainly intend to submit an application likely in partnership with our neighboring states. A successful application would carry multiple benefits, not just in Wyoming. In Wyoming, it's gonna help preserve jobs and it's gonna create new, higher quality jobs with the added value opportunity there. It's also gonna benefit some of the service companies, the small businesses in the state as well. 
The benefits extend beyond our borders and look to our neighboring states and even further afield to our geo commodity markets like California and elsewhere. It provides them an opportunity to immediately recognize uh, a, a progress towards their own decarbonization goals. There's even a potential export opportunity there where Wyoming clean hydrogen could be accessed, uh, exported to countries in Asia and help them. There's also a strategic opportunity through the establishment of critical infrastructure through the I-80 corridor, uh, creating essentially a transcontinental hydrogen transportation system linking east with west. Mr. Chairman, in summary, any discussion around hydrogen, uh, be it in relation to hubs or not, uh, should include Wyoming because Wyoming <clears throat> is a microcosm of our energy industry overall. And our, our, I think when we believe our practices and intent mirror that uh, and reflect that of the industry, industry overall with respect to hydrogen. Furthermore, any success of developing a hydrogen infrastructure in the state will benefit not only Wyomingites in our neighboring states, but potentially literally millions of Americans across the country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. And now we'll have Mr. Lewis. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Senator Langford, distinguished members of the committee. My name is Jonathan Lewis. I'm Senior Counsel and Director of Transportation Decarbonization at Clean Air Task Force. CATF is a global nonprofit organization working to safeguard against the worst impacts of climate change by catalyzing the rapid development and deployment of low carbon energy and other climate protecting technologies. CATF has submitted written testimony from Mike Fowler, our Director of Advanced Energy Technology Research. Today, I will share CATF's thoughts on how hydrogen can help meet the challenge of fully decarbonizing the US economy by mid-century which sectors are likely to require hydrogen to decarbonize, and what types of research, development, demonstration, and deployment programs for hydrogen will help the United States meet its ambitious climate goals. First, the climate challenge is vast and urgent. Achieving net zero emissions across the energy system within several decades will require transitions in both energy production and many varied end use sectors. Much of that transition will occur through electrification and vast expansion of renewable energy resources. Electrification is essential to decarbonization. However, it is not by itself sufficient. Today, 80% of end use energy is provided by fuel molecules. Some of those end uses can be electrified, but not all of them. So we will need zero carbon fuels like hydrogen. Hydrogen is a versatile carbon-free energy carrier that can substitute for some conventional fossil fuels. We already have considerable industrial experience making and using hydrogen and we are developing and innovating improved techniques for producing very low carbon hydrogen. In the United States, hydrogen provides an enormous opportunity for decarbonization in certain sectors and could contribute to reducing CO2 emissions by a billion metric tons per year or more. Hydrogen could be essential in decarbonizing heavy transportation, such as heavy duty trucking, marine shipping, and aviation. Hydrogen will also be needed to decarbonize heavy industry, for example, in the combustion of fuels for process heating and in iron making. Finally, hydrogen might also have a role to play in the power sector as a load balancer to help enable a renewables heavy grid. Demand for clean hydrogen is projected to glow globally due to net zero carbon goals and demand in the United States could be 10 quadrillion BTU or more by mid-century. To meet decarbonization goals, that hydrogen will need to be clean. Clean hydrogen can be produced in multiple ways, most notably by electrolysis using zero carbon electricity or by methane reforming using natural gas with carbon capture. Requirements for how clean this hydrogen must be will depend on the context and should evolve over time. What we know now is that hydrogen produced with natural gas must include very high level of carbon capture for reformers and extremely low methane loss rates for natural gas used in the production, as well as low CO2 intensity of electricity used in those production processes. Likewise, hydrogen produced with electrolyzers needs to utilize electricity that is clean and additional to existing and planned zero carbon electricity generation. The road to decarbonization with hydrogen is not entirely clear today. So it is important that we pursue multiple clean production pathways simultaneously. Federal R&D and demonstration programs will play a key role in building scale, industry learning, and seeding growth. Policies that support deployment of clean hydrogen will also be essential. Developing and commercializing the technologies needed for affordable and clean hydrogen production, transportation, and use across varied supply chains will require sustained and committed financial support from the US government. And although our d, &D support is extremely useful, it will not likely be enough to overcome cost and build-out challenges for hydrogen. To maximize the hydrogen decarbonization opportunity, support for broader clean hydrogen deployment will also be needed. This support may take a variety of forms with tax incentives for hydrogen 
a key tool currently under discussion in Congress. Production tax incentives are especially important and can be calibrated to provide greater support for cleaner hydrogen production. With deployment, we can expect clean hydrogen costs to come down dramatically. Cleaner Task Force looks forward to continued engagement with this committee on issues related to clean hydrogen, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, sir. Mr. Graff? Chairman Manchin and members of the committee, on behalf of Air Liquide's more than 23,000 U.S. employees, thank you for highlighting hydrogen's role in the energy transition. Thank you also for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Mike Graff, and I am the chairman and CEO of American Air Liquide. We are a world leader in the production and distribution of industrial gases, including hydrogen. Air Liquide, a proud founding member of the Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Energy Association, entered the hydrogen market over 60 years ago, leading industry efforts on investment, research, and technology development. With more than $1 billion already invested in hydrogen activities in the U.S. and more than $5 billion worldwide, Air Liquide is actively building the hydrogen future. In fact, we have committed to an additional investment of nearly $10 billion in low-carbon hydrogen by 2035 to more than triple sales of hydrogen and help substantially curb emissions. Importantly, hydrogen can ensure that the U.S. remains a leader in the energy economy of the future. By 2030, the U.S. hydrogen economy could generate $140 billion per year in revenue and support 700,000 local jobs. Globally, Air Liquide operates in 78 countries, and we see countries making comparable and sometimes greater investments in hydrogen. I hope that much of the nearly $10 billion mentioned will be invested here in the U.S. As I often say, hydrogen alone will not drive the clean energy transition, but the energy transition will not happen without hydrogen. It will take the concerted efforts of both industry and government to help achieve the nation's goal of net zero emissions by 2050. For our part, the private sector is ready to lead. The government's development of a flexible policy portfolio that rewards outcomes, allows for market growth, and drives innovation and private investment can help ensure a self-sustaining market and rapid adoption at scale while promoting smart climate policy. Programs like DOE's Earthshot, which is focused on reducing the cost of clean energy, illustrate the importance of the public-private partnership. Additionally, rapid implementation of the hydrogen hubs will help grow the ecosystems needed to develop the entire hydrogen value chain at scale, galvanizing a national hydrogen market. Proposed policies like the Hydrogen Infrastructure Initiative and Clean Hydrogen Production Act will incentivize the production and deployment of low-carbon hydrogen, help create high-paying jobs, and lower CO2 emissions across many sectors. Air Liquide is an active participant in all of these government efforts, which are essential for catalyzing hydrogen's role in the energy transition. As the policy framework develops, we must ensure that the U.S. can lead in hydrogen production. Hydrogen is versatile. This versatility enables us to leverage our vast and varied natural resources and develop the right combination of investment, production pathways, and end uses to meet our nation's needs. For example, Mr. Chairman, as you well know, in Appalachia, there is an abundant supply of natural gas. We can produce hydrogen from that supply, dramatically reducing transportation emissions compared to gasoline or diesel. And Air Liquide's cryocap, a suite of carbon capture solutions can further reduce CO2 emissions by over 90% at a steam methane reformer. Or, in a state like New Mexico, which as Senator Heinrich knows, there is an abundant solar power, and that abundant solar power and electrolysis can be used to create low-carbon hydrogen. The same is true in regions with abundant wind and hydropower. Air Liquide operates the world's largest proton exchange membrane electrolyzer, utilizing hydropower from the Canadian side of Niagara Falls to produce and supply the Northeast U.S. with low-carbon renewable hydrogen. The government should consider all options for hydrogen production to help reach the nation's net zero climate goal. By focusing on the outcome of hydrogen use, we can address the carbon intensity of hydrogen and enable producers to provide a robust supply of low-cost hydrogen while minimizing the environmental impact. Hydrogen is also very versatile in all its applications. For instance, in industrial applications, like supplying the chemical industry in Senator Cassidy's Louisiana, carbon capture, biogas, and hydrogen 
can be used to reduce the carbon footprint of this hard to abate sector. And as renewable power grows throughout the nation, hydrogen can address the intermittency issues of renewable power sources. By producing hydrogen from low carbon power when grid supply outpaces demand and then storing it for later use. Transportation is another exciting application. In Nevada, as Senator Cortez Masto knows, we will soon start up a $250 million hydrogen production facility that will use biogas to supply the mobility market in California and provide fuel for up to 40,000 fuel cell vehicles. As I said in the beginning, hydrogen alone will not drive the clean energy transition, but the energy transition will not happen without hydrogen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'll be very happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Mr. Lavenka, pronounce that for me. Lavenka. Lavenka. You're, you're very good. The close. H is silent. <laughs> That's gotcha. right. Uh, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Langford, and distinguished members of this committee, uh, my name is Brian Lavenka. I am the Vice President of New Energy Ventures for Williams Companies. I lead a team of business developers focused on creating decarbonization solutions for the future. I'm also the vice chairman of the Clean Hydrogen Future Coalition. We are a diverse industry group focused on an all of the above approach to the development of a clean hydrogen economy. I want to start by saying thank you very much for, for having us. We believe at Williams that hydrogen is a very important topic and one that if we're serious about decarbonization has to be uh, top of mind. Uh, Williams is one of the nation's largest natural gas infrastructure companies. Um, today, we deliver about 30% of the nation's natural gas on a daily basis. Um, over the last century, we've built out an energy delivery platform that really is second to none. Um, and moving forward over the next century, we expect to continue doing that. We also realize that we can continue to improve our business, we can focus on sustainability, and we can look towards things like hydrogen that can work towards decarbonization of the overall grid. In 2020, Williams was the first North American midstream company to make a climate commitment. We've set very specific targeted goals that we plan to achieve to lower our emissions footprint, but also enable our customers, many of whom are facing the same decarbonization challenges, to do the same. We've set near-term goals to reduce our footprint by 56% by 2030, employing right here, right now strategies to lower our footprint, but also have an eye towards a net zero ambition by 2050. And this is where we turn our focus to hydrogen and other similar technologies. Uh, we believe hydrogen has the ability to be scalable, to ultimately achieve real changes when it comes to decarbonization. And we think that our infrastructure at Williams plays a very important part in that role. Senator Langford mentioned the ability to utilize existing infrastructure to move clean molecules from where they're produced to where they are used. We think our natural gas infrastructure is perfectly situated to provide such a solution. A cornerstone of my team's work is based on hydrogen. We're looking at the entire value chain of hydrogen, not just production, not just in use, but also how do you cost effectively and efficiently move molecules to market. And we believe that our infrastructure will provide that solution. In the near term, we can begin blending hydrogen at low percentages and over time, move that percentage up to really push towards higher and higher decarbonization efforts. We're currently developing and executing real projects along our existing footprint. That includes states like Wyoming, Oklahoma, includes Appalachia, the Pacific Northwest, uh, the Southeast and Gulf Coast regions. The breadth of our footprint really gives us the ability to take multiple approaches to hydrogen, both on the production side and the end use side. We do believe that carbon intensity is the important part here. We have to focus on not just colors, but really how do we continue to lower the carbon intensity of the hydrogen that we're producing and using. A colorblind approach is very important. It's one of the key cornerstones of the Clean Hydrogen Future Coalition. We think we can do projects today and we are doing projects today that can reduce emissions in the near term. But we also know that to get to scale, we're gonna need help, we're gonna need new partnerships, we're gonna need industry, we're gonna need academia, we're gonna need regulators, we're gonna need the people in this room to put together solutions for the future. That's why this hearing is so important. We need help. 
our, the R D and D dollars that are available are a great start. We believe other incentives are needed to really kickstart the development of a clean hydrogen economy. Williams is making a very big push towards a clean energy future, and hydrogen is a very important part of that. We believe it provides scalability that no other options can provide. Thank you again for the time today. I look forward to the conversation and addressing your questions. Thank you very much. I want to thank you all for your testimonies. Now we're going to begin our questioning. And I, uh, I've been trying to gather some information here, but I'll, I'm more excited about this, uh, this hearing than I have for many, uh, because I truly believe that uh, we're going down a path if we don't correct ourselves on what we can do in America to basically be in a clean society, if you will, in a clean climate society, and using all the resources we have available to us, shame on us. And right now there's a movement on EVs. I have nothing against EVs, except we don't produce any of the raw products or refine anything that goes into contributing making them. It scares the bejesus out of me where we're going, because I'm old enough to remember standing in line in 1974 waiting to buy gas. I don't want to stand in line waiting to buy a battery. So I'm very much concerned about that. And hydrogen is where I believe. Let me tell you what we've done. Uh, and and the, the transformation that's gone on in the clean energy for renewables has been unbelievable. In the last 10 years, think about this. In 10 years, what we've done with wind and solar, wind and solar, and we see how it's come down in cost and being so competitive. And, and I think it's wonderful. We have a big wind projects in West Virginia. Solar has not been so much. We should be doing a lot more. But overall, if you look to basically wind generation has fallen 74% and utility scale solar has dropped 82%. LED light bulbs have dropped 95% in cost. Uh, in all that, you know, uh, when you think about what we're doing and where we're going, what direction, Congress invested just $9.5 billion in clean for energy, uh, for uh, hydrogen, first time. Let me give you the last 10 years what's happened. So if you want to look how we did what we've done in, in renewables and wind and solar, uh, to the DOE, we've put about $10 billion in research and development, and, and development in the last 10 years. In the last 10 years for hydrogen, we put $2 billion. Let me tell you what's happened for credits. In the last 10 years, credits, production tax credits for wind and solar have been 25 to $30 billion that we've invested. Hydrogen, zero production tax credit. We have got to get off the dime and start doing something. If we're going to be left behind and be totally, totally subservient to China, I believe. I believe we're putting ourselves in one hell of a mess. So I want to thank you all. I would like to know, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Sachipal, you know, you've, you've, you're renowned in, in your knowledge and, and your expertise and what you've been able to do. Tell me how we're able to accelerate and advance to get up in speed. And do you think we can do it in a decade? In one decade, can we make the transformation that's been made in wind and solar and hydrogen? And then I'm going to go, Mr. Graff, to you next, because you're, in, you're on the front lines in the real world. Um, thank you, Chairman Manchin. And uh, again, thank you for your tremendous support for hydrogen. And I would say that right now, we are really positioned to accelerate progress. Thanks again to the bipartisan infrastructure law and that $9.5 billion, in addition to the contain, continued you know, sustained annual appropriations. I think we are um, exactly positioned to cover the R&D, but very rapidly um, accelerate both manufacturing to get to scale as well as deployment. So, for instance, the, the hubs, obviously, will really provide that launching point. But I think it's, it's to your question of, you know, are we going to be able to catch up in, within those 10 years? Um, I think we really need that very comprehensive approach. It's not just about the R&D or the deployments, um, that holistic view. So we're definitely very well uh, versed in what's happening. Can it happening be done in 10 years, one decade? Within 10 years, there's a lot of opportunity if we get things right. Mr. Graff. Mr. Chairman, I think that there's already uh, a lot of effort and a lot of work that's been proven at scale in industry. I think the private sector has the technologies, the know-how, and, and we ourselves and others have already built at scale, whether that is to, to utilize carbon capture and utilize natural gas to produce hydrogen or electrolysis, as well as the with carbon With blue, capture. we need carbon capture. With green, we need, we need not. So 
Exactly. Correct. So I, th I think with the low carbon aspect, we have the clear ability to take steam methane reformers utilizing natural gas and utilizing technologies like our cryo cap, reduce the total carbon emissions by more than 90%. And so you end up with a very low carbon source of hydrogen. We also are able to produce the renewable sources of hydrogen as well. So I think industry, I think the private sector is ready, but, but it can't be done alone. I think, I think there's got to be a clear role in a public-private partnership with the government to have smart climate policy that incentivizes the need to build the infrastructure to make this occur. And as I mentioned in my opening remarks, we see a very clear path to basically within 10 years get ourselves to a place where we've made a real difference. And that real difference will not solve all the issues to get us to net neutral, which is the goal by 2050, which is also our company's goal. But we have those capabilities to really get off the ground within 10 years. The reason I'm so excited is my state basically is about 90 to 93 percent dependent on coal-fired power. We know the transition is happening and it has to happen. We understand that. We have some of the cleanest power plants in the country, some of the largest, 2,500 megawatts. Those are big, those are big boys. And we produce an awful lot of the power for the East Coast. So we're a net exporter of power. With that, we've been blessed with the notion of energy underneath our feet, with natural gas, Marcellus shell, we got the Utica shell. We have the Rogers shell that we haven't even touched yet. There's so much going on. And the ability for us to transform ourselves and basically be an energy hub, but a ma mass producer. On top of that, we have the industrial from the standpoint of the petrochemical plants. You know, we were one of the leading petrochemical plants producing for World War II that got us some of the nylon was invented in West Virginia. You go on and on and on what we've been able to do. We need to transform those areas, whether it be Wyoming as a big coal producer, us as the largest right now as far as still dependent on coal power. But those are where your, your hubs can be from the standpoint to produce the energy. that We, can, we have the pipeline system. Maybe we can at least get our, our, uh, our uh, environmental friends to help us build a pipeline that will carry clean hydrogen. They're stopping everything we've got. Now we can't get a product out of the market. We need that help. But So what I'm saying on that, this is so vital, and I think I'm, I'm fine and willing to go down a two-path two system. EV is fine to a certain extent, but we have to make sure that we understand can't get Thacker passed. That's not going to happen, I don't think. And uh, uh huh. But I'm just saying enough to produce what we're what we're right. But but with that, the refinery of it, the processing of it, I don't see any of that in America. I don't see any of that happening soon in America. That's the problem. So with that being what dependent as we are, that's what my concerns are. With that, I've taken more than enough time, and I'll turn it over to Senator Langford. Well, I'm going to go ahead and defer uh, ahead. my questions to the very end, and so we can go get some of the folks that are here on the panel. I'm going to be here the whole time, and some of these folks are going to come in and out. So. If that's the case, then we'll go right to Senator Cassidy. My hey, thank you, and thank, thank you for your graciousness, Senator Langford. Um, you know, the interesting thing is it appears that we have bipartisan agreement that hydrogen, hydrogen hubs is something that can point us towards a lower carbon future. So um, now, Ms. Paul, I uh, apologize because I'm going to ask you about something which in one sense you can't answer, but I think I can express my frustration. Um, clearly, it would be... Our witness from Wyoming spoke about how they're one of two states with primacy in terms of permitting for CCUS. And he spoke to that as a facilitator of development, of development that will lower our carbon footprint as we continue to power in a modern economy. Now, I guess my plea, if you will, uh, Louisiana has an application to permit and site carbon capture sequestration wells. They have primacy. By the way, I think we have 26 geologists on the staff of our Department of Natural Resources, and Region 6 has six for the entire region. It's been complete since October, and EPA has told the state they require no further edits to the application. But instead of accepting the application and forwarding it to the, the EPA here in Washington, Region 6 has sat on it. They will not forward it. They will not say, oh, we need these edits. They just sit on it. And so instead of facilitating the development of these CCUS projects, which is bipartisan common ground, 
It is sitting on an application and we don't know why. And knowing that this puts you in a difficult position, but do you think it's right that the region six should be sitting on this application and not forwarding it? Thank you, Senator Cassidy. And first of all, thanks for your interest in hydrogen. And we had your participation in the hydrogen shot uh, summits as well. And so we are committed and I'll take the action to go back to DOE and see what we can do to, to expedite, understand what the situation is regarding the, the permit. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate that because we want to move forward on this and we've got an industrial corridor that can benefit from it. And as long as it's held up in a bureaucratic kind of, um, we're not gonna move it, we're not gonna tell you why, uh, it is kind of the worst example of government at not work. Um, Mr. Levinka or Mr. Graff, let me start with Mr. Graff. Mr. Graff, uh, 45 QS, what is its importance in terms of facilitating these projects for blue hydrogen or for otherwise sequestering products? And um, what do you think about proposals to increase it? I'm kind of begging an answer, but please give your perspective. Senator, thanks for the question. Clearly, 45Q is, is one of the policies, one of the laws uh, that will help incentivize carbon capture and incentivize the use of natural gas in hydrogen production. Uh, there's a lot of estimates. I believe the uh, National Petroleum Council had issued a report uh, about two years ago. We were a part of that development where it talked about incentives in order to go ahead and drive at scale and also to drive the conversion of up to 25% of all heavy industrial capacity uh, to a low carbon state. And 45Q today provides roughly $50 uh, per ton. Uh, I think that study suggested to get to $90 was where you needed to be to drive the real investments at scale and $110 to really begin to decarbonize at least 25% of the industrial infrastructure. But I don't think that it's 45Q alone. I think the, the Clean Hydrogen Production Act, which is under consideration today, is another big piece of what we can do. And if we can put these together, we can fully utilize natural gas resources, we can provide and produce hydrogen of low carbon content and, preserve, and preserve natural gas liquids and, and the production of those liquids for the chemical sector. Okay, uh, Mr. Lewis, let me ask. One of the issues, and I understand that if we push, if we, if we transport hydrogen by pipeline, it's much more efficient than putting it in pressurized tanks. It's less energy intensive. Uh, but there has been a problem getting FERC to approve pipelines. Another example of we have met the enemy and he is the federal government. Uh, what is the importance of regulatory certainty in terms of permitting these pipelines that would then allow the promise of a de decarbonized or a relatively decarbonized future uh, using hydrogen as a means to relatively decarbonize. Uh, thank you for your question, Senator Cassidy. Uh, it's a great question. Regulatory certainty is clearly important for many of the industries and other stakeholders in this sector to make the major investments that we're going to need to make to achieve the um, the objectives that Chairman Manchin mentioned for um, over the next decade. With respect to pipelines, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to understand the extent to which existing pipelines, natural gas pipelines, existing natural gas right away might be used to um, move hydrogen. We hope that um, using that existing infrastructure is possible, but uh, we're closely watching that space to see what can be done safely and what can be done efficiently. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to end. Thank you for your graciousness again, uh, Senator Lankford. And just to say, I began and I ended with the fact that the executive branch is putting brakes upon the desire of the private sector to build out to a lower carbon future. And so for an administration that claims to want a lower carbon future, they could begin by giving the regulatory certainty and facilitating the states doing their own facilitation uh, to make that promise real. Thank you, I yield. Thank you, Senator. And Senator Heinrich. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, I, I want to keep uh, things sort of brief because I've got a long list of questions I'd love to get to. But for any of you, what can we do to bring down the cost of electrolysis faster and further? 
uh, or further and faster, I should say. Go ahead, Doctor. Um, thank you so much, Senator. And we've already launched the H2 New Consortium with our national labs. Today, we're at about $1,000 to $1,500 a kilowatt. Um, we need to be about 10 times less. And so we've already mobilized uh, our resources. And with Hydrogen Shot, we really have a good shot at getting there within a decade. Uh, do you have any uh, opinions on the future of the direction of electrolysis proton exchange membranes versus alkaline water electrolysis? Yes, and we believe that we need the portfolio. So some of the conventional alkaline will be able to be deployed right away. We still need to reduce cost with PEM, and then we have even more advanced electrolysis like high temperature. So we have the entire Great. portfolio. Super. Uh, Mr. Lewis, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance projects that hydrogen from electrolysis is going to be cheaper than hydrogen with carbon capture and sequestration by around 2030. Uh, if that's even remotely accurate, talk to me about whether hydrogen with carbon capture and sequestration sequestration projects risk being stranded assets? We need a lot of clean hydrogen quickly. We need it to be cost competitive. Mm -hmm. And making that hydrogen from any one particular energy source is going to be very difficult. So we, need, we think we need to deploy all the clean energy resources we can to produce hydrogen that has sufficiently low carbon intensity. Um, our expectation is that Hydrogen made from natural gas with carbon capture sequestration is significantly cheaper than green electrolytic processes right now. We're going to see improvements, if you think, on both of those, very steep improvements on the electrolytic side. Mm -hmm. um, but we think that in order to um, really take advantage of the benefits that hydrogen can provide to the decarbonization effort, we need um, as much of it as we can as possible, and we're going to need both. What, what I'm getting at is if you do a big, not a distributed project, and electrolysis is small and distributed and, and iterative, um, whereas if you do a big, expensive project that requires carbon capture and sequestration, you're, you really need 20, 30 years to make that money back. So, uh, Mr. Lavinka, do you have thoughts about that, how we avoid, you know, in, in the interest of, of doing things in steps, how do we avoid making long-term investments that end up being um, non-cost effective in, in just a few years? Sure. Thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, we believe that the ability to quickly scale the production of hydrogen does lean towards SMRs with CCUS. And so this is really where we also think the ability to locate those next to existing sequestration sites and next to existing infrastructure is incredibly important to alleviate some of those costs that would be required for new build out of infrastructure. Um, and so the, the, the report you referenced around the development of green hydrogen and electrolysis and bringing that cost down over the next 10 years, uh, we think that's very aggressive. And we think that there's near term opportunity to produce large amounts of clean hydrogen without uh, the use of electrolysis. Dr. Sataya Paul, um, Given the issues we struggle with, including in my state in, in great degree, with fugitive methane in the natural gas supply chain, how do we measure the carbon intensity of technologies like steam methane reform with CCS um, to accurately reflect the entire carbon intensity? So not just you know the, the reductions that we've heard about today, but you have to uh, account for upstream emissions as well. Thank you, Senator. And uh, we're definitely cognizant of the upstream emissions issue and committed to reducing that. Um, right now, we have a significant analysis underway, and we look forward to working on the clean hydrogen standard, which is in the bipartisan infrastructure law. But upstream emissions is, is obviously a, a significant issue. Our focus is clean hydrogen. So one of the things we haven't talked about today is that the debate about where best to deploy hydrogen, and to some degree the market will, will decide that, but I'm curious your thoughts on, in, you know, 10 years from now, are we going to see hydrogen primarily as a solution to the decarbonization of these hard sectors, heavy shipping, heavy trucking, uh, industrial, as a storage medium for electric generation or both? Any of you? Mr. Graff, Gaff. Senator, I, I think there's, there's a couple key points to, to be made. Um, first of all, I would say in terms of the sectors, 
I believe in 10 years you will see the benefits of hydrogen, first of all, in transportation. Hmm. There's already an element for, for light-duty vehicles, but I think the real benefit it's going to be for commercial vehicles, heavy-duty vehicles, return to base type operations, warehouse type facilities, uh, as well as kind of the class A tractor trailer that's on the road. The utilization of hydrogen fuel cells and utilizing storage of hydrogen on board takes minimal space and much less weight than a full battery array to accomplish the same goal. So you preserve the payload, you preserve the ability to manage that, and recognize that the usability of hydrogen is very similar to what you have today. For a passenger vehicle, you pull into your, your, your refueling station, and five minutes later, you're on your way to drive another 300, 400, 500 miles, whatever the case may be for your vehicle. There's not a long-term charging aspect to that. And you have something even yeah, better. I'll, I'll give you that, but the reality is we don't have that infrastructure anywhere today, and all of us have a plug at our home. So it's not really inconvenient for me to plug in my electric vehicle. I think it's a we, different situation with tractor trailers, obviously. Fair. I, I believe, though, if you think about commercial vehicles and we think about the heavy duty in return to base operations and you begin to go ahead and set up significant infrastructure to meet those needs, then I believe it is a real solution. Great. I think also for industry, you will see it in chemicals and you will see it in steel over that time. And for the grid, definitely for backup for solar and for wind. We have already built the world's largest hydrogen storage facility in Beaumont, Texas. And it contains enough hydrogen energy to go ahead and back up a new full-scale nuclear <laughs> power plant for one to two weeks Great. if you build out the infrastructure. So I think there's a lot of capability. Great. Thank you, Mr. Graff. And, and I apologize, Chairman, for running over for a couple minutes here. It's I appreciate it. Extremely important. Very calling. important. Thank you. Uh, and now we have, by WebEx, uh, Senator Hoven. Early. God bless you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate you holding the hearing. <laughs> Let me start with Dr. Morrell. Um, you know, Wyoming and North Dakota are two states that have the regulatory, uh, both the state and EPA regulatory approval in place to actually uh, store CO2 through carbon capture and sequestration, uh, as well as the geology to do it. And so my question to you is, what do you think has to happen for us to take our coal-fired electric plants <clears throat> and capture that CO2 and then either uh, continue to produce electricity or even uh, produce hydrogen. What are the things that you think has to happen? What kind of help has to be there for our industry leading uh, companies to do that? Uh, thank you, Senator. The, the, the answer is simply to continue what we're doing with the large pilots, uh, the, the demonstration projects, uh, the proof out of the technology itself. Uh, you know, we look historically at CCUS across the country, and it has been a story of technical success and economic failure. And the, that brings up the role of 45Q in the future as well, and the boosting of that from where it is at $50 a ton, perhaps up to, I believe it was $85 a ton, has been mentioned in passing before. Uh, those things have to be uh, implemented and, and executed in the field and get these things proven out as, as real and viable technologies not just for the, for the preservation of our thermal fleet, but also in the context of the development of a uh, blue hydrogen economy. And where do you see the first hydrogen going in bulk? Well, provided that we can do this, where do you see that, uh, you know, that, that fuel going? So if I can speak to, uh, sorry, excuse me, Senator, the, uh, if I can speak to the examples in Wyoming, it is mostly, there are nodes of interest. There's a southwestern um, area of interest around the Opal and Echo Springs natural gas uh, processing facilities, and there's a southeastern uh, node around the Cheyenne area, which is mostly or predominantly a renewables uh, source. And they're looking more towards the, um, the, the they, they're good production centers. They're obviously looking for a value chain integration in terms of consumption. So the southeast pool around Cheyenne is obviously looking towards uh, delivering hydrogen into the Denver metropole area. Uh, the southwest pool is looking more towards Salt Lake City, even further afield, utilizing our existing natural gas pipelines to deliver it further to the west coast and perhaps even beyond. Um, there's a lot of competition, uh, not just Wyoming and North Dakota, but Texas, uh, this area around here, and, and um, uh, uh, Chairman Mansions region is also having great progress with development. Uh, and a lot of it hinges on that value chain integration, connecting the generation with the consumption centers. And what do you see as the use of that hydrogen in those nodes? What, what is it primarily going to be used? 
Yeah, it's going to be multiple use. If you're looking to Denver, it'll be uh, a combination probably, first of all, as a transportation fuel, but there is also great opportunity event, uh, to step forward into more of a um, utility-based consumption model. Uh, and then further after that, it'll be more into the, the advanced technologies around synthetic fuels and petrochemicals and other. I think for the most part, it'll be led by a combination of either transportation fuels or utility power sector. And timelines, what kind of time, how, how soon could we be making this happen, in your opinion? Uh, in, in Wyoming, we have nine projects, real projects in development. Um, the first hydrogen, we're probably looking in the next um, 18 months or so. 18 months? Uh, Mr. Helvinka, uh, kind of the same question, um, but along, you know, where do you see this product going? Who's going to get it done first, in your opinion? And can we use the existing pipelines, like natural gas pipelines and that kind of thing? Yeah, thank you for the question, Senator. Um, kind of tacking on to what Dr. Morell said, uh, we have at Williams a, a real project in the state of Wyoming that is focused in the Opal region where we're taking uh, wind power produced in the state and generating clean hydrogen that we plan to put into our pipeline system. Uh, we own an asset called Northwest Pipeline which moves currently natural gas from southwest Wyoming up to the Pacific Northwest into states like Washington and Oregon. Um, we see the ability to blend that hydrogen into our existing systems as a great start to uh, really begin the development of a clean hydrogen economy. Our customers, many of whom are power generation uh, customers, many of whom are local distribution companies or other industrial users, are trying to find ways to decarbonize their fuel supply as well. And so we see this as a great way to, to start using our existing assets. Um, we also see the ability for ourselves to utilize hydrogen as a fuel. Uh, we, we run a number of compressor stations along our pipelines that consume fuel. Uh, we think hydrogen is a great way for ourselves to decarbonize as well. Dr. Uh, Satya Paul, uh, shouldn't we be doing more to make sure that we're deploying carbon capture technologies as part of developing um, more this this move to hydrogen. Thank you, Senator Hoven. And I would also like to thank you for your leadership on the Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Caucus, uh, first of all, and all the support for hydrogen. And as you know, in the bipartisan infrastructure law, we have tremendous opportunity for CCS as well. So our office is committed to accelerating progress there as well. We want to work with you on the CCUS. We're a long way down the trail and uh, look forward to continuing to uh, to uh, make sure that we make it commercially viable and want your help in doing that. Sir Cortez Master. Thank you. Uh, first of all, let me just say, so appreciate this panel and the discussion today. I, I am sorry the chairman had to step out because I, I, I do think to put this in perspective, we're all saying the same thing here. Uh, it, it is uh, the opportunity to, depending on where we live, identify what clean energy portfolio works best for us based on our geography and minerals and background with the outcome of reducing that carbon footprint and taking into consideration investments in technologies that are gonna help us do that. Um, one of the things that I think is important for all of us to uh, remember, and we've all supported this, was that innovation economy is also going to be uh, beneficial for us, but we also have to ensure we uh, continue to focus on the critical minerals that are important uh, for that innovation technology. And I think it's an all hands-on approach. So to me, it's not just about making sure we invest in solar and geothermal and other opportunities. It's investments in everything that is going to help us reduce that carbon footprint. Not one of them is competing against the other. They're compatible is my understanding. So I, I would, uh, and um, Mr. Graff, let me just ask you this, and it's great to see you. We are so excited uh, that you're in, uh, in uh, North Las Vegas, um, and we are looking forward to continued uh, collaboration because you're going to just bring incredible opportunities for jobs as well in this sector. But sometimes there is this idea that electric vehicles compete with hydrogen-fueled celled vehicles. And technically, they really don't. They're compatible with the goal here of reducing a carbon footprint, right? So we should continue the investment in both, uh, it, but making sure that investment here in the United States is happening because the other countries are already doing it. Is that correct? That, that's correct, Senator. And, and there is no doubt that uh, I think that there is uh, a clear path forward for both to be used in the right uses, the right places, in the right ecosystem. It's already proven that the light 
you know, duty vehicles are already working with batteries. You've got to make sure you continue to bolster the grid and you can provide that capability. Um, and, and there's no doubt that there's a real place, as I mentioned before, in all the ways which I won't repeat, for the use of hydrogen as well. Globally, there is a huge effort in this regard. I think 30 countries around the world have already developed a clear hydrogen strategy and pathway for their countries. And there are probably a level of 70 billion plus incentives from various governments to go ahead and help incentivize that to occur. There are somewhere in the order of 230 large-scale major projects announced, of which 85% uh, are in Europe, Asia, or Australia. The others are a mix between the Americas and the Middle East. And, and so I think that there is a real focus on this. Uh, those projects as announced that have come out are $300 billion in investment, of which I think about 120, 130 billion is already in engineering or in construction. So I think it's real. I think we have to recognize those pathways. And I would fully agree that we have to look at this as an ecosystem for a given geography. And we've got to make sure we tailor the use and the benefits to reduce the carbon footprint in any way possible with that ecosystem. And even utilizing renewable forms of natural gas from landfills and biogesters, which we know how to do. That's right. Thank you. Um, let me ask you, um, Dr. Sachi Paul, uh, I thank you for your work and leadership um, at the department as well. Um, when it comes to hydrogen jobs, you talked a little bit about this because I think this is another opportunity to really grow our workforce. Um, and you highlighted the need for the U.S. to develop that robust workforce. Can you please talk to us about what types of background or professional experience or what types of jobs will come with this uh, investment in um, hydrogen fuels? Thank you so much, Senator. And we did actually launch a new project called H2 Edge, um, which will help us to look at the workforce needed and training, accreditation. And because it's so diverse, we have the entire value chain, so production, construction, engineering, maintenance, repair, um, hydrogen tanks, infrastructure, dispensers, um, the, the actual fuel cells, membranes, electrolyzers. So uh, there's just tremendous opportunity across the entire supply chain. So the 700,000 jobs opportunity was mentioned, and we'll, as we launch the hubs and get more deployments, we'll have more uh, awareness of you know, where exactly are those jobs and how do we ensure that they're sustainable. Thank you. Thank you again. It's a great discussion. Thank you to the panelists. Senator Marshall. All right. Thank you, Chairman. And certainly we all do agree here, the panel um, and, and the members here on the dais, that we, had this, we share the same goals. We don't always agree how to get there. And I think we disagree sometimes on how we environmentally score the impacts of these different technologies. Uh, Mr. Levink, I grew up in a small oil town. We had three oil refineries and a Williams Pipeline had a large presence there. Several friends whose fathers worked there and they were really good jobs. Well paid. Um, my grandfather was a welder. I, I, I could weld, but welding for a pipeline is a very special skill. And I've seen the uh, technology improve through the years. I'm told it's 95% more efficient, 95% less uh, gases re released or, or fuel spillage, those types of things from pipelines today. Most all of our land, farmland we own, have pipelines running through it. And the environmental impact is nothing. We graze cattle back where the pipeline is. We, we farm over them. Uh, the, the, the pheasants, the quail don't seem to mi mind that there's a pipeline under there. On the other hand, in the last 25 years, we've had an explosion of wind energy in Kansas, and I'm grateful for that. I think 45% of the electricity in Kansas generated from wind, but I've seen their environmental Im impact really be significant. The, the lines, the power lines that carry these, the towers are 50% taller, I'm guessing. They're made out of steel rather than wood. Uh, they're, they're thicker, they're bigger. Uh, and as solar farms come in behind them as well, that, that envir there's a significant enviro environmental impact of getting that energy, the wind energy or solar energy out of Kansas because we don't need it all, we're selling it as well. How do you score environmental impacts of your, of your industry pipeline versus something from wind energy or, or solar energy on the transportation part of it? Sure. Thank you, Senator Marshall. And um, I would say 
to start, we agree that the most efficient and safe way to move energy is through pipeline infrastructure. Uh, it's why we're focused on finding ways to make sure that as the hydrogen economy develops, we can utilize existing infrastructure to do just that. Um, that said, I think we're very big believers in an all of the above approach. We think that um, wind and solar do have a role to play in the future of energy, both as just power producers, but also as suppliers to hydrogen production. And so um, as part of our base business, we're very focused on ensuring we can continue to so deliver. Do you have a way to score environmental impact of pipelines versus transmission through uh, power lines for solar and wind? I, I can't find that. In terms of scoring, I, I, there's definitely life cycle analyses that can be done. Um, I kind of relate it back to efficiency as well, of how much energy are you losing through those processes. And so um, I, I do believe that there are metrics that can be shown uh, to compare the two, yes. Okay, Dr. Murrell, I um, want to continue down this uh, pipeline of environmental footprints from cradle to grave. Uh, in Wyoming, you consider the cradle to grave impact, uh, environmental impact of hydrogen versus coal versus natural gas. How do you guys look at that? Uh, not just tailpipe emission, but the total environmental impact. How do you score that? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you, Senator. It's a difficult question to answer because it's such a broad context. Uh, Mr. Halinka mentioned life cycle assessments. Life cycle assessments are extremely sensitive to the model that you're trying to understand. So being able to compare one uh, to another is, is, is literally the apples and oranges problem. Uh, but we take it as a uh, very much a holistic view. Where that's why we're having a net zero uh, aspiration in the state, uh, which is uh, scope one, of course, which is our direct emissions. Uh, but it, is, um, it allows us to have part, portions of the economy that are emitting uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases, provided others parts are acting as sinks. And that allows us to uh, accommodate those varying um, economic parameters and industrial parameters within the state. Okay. Got any time left? Yeah. Dr. Satyapal, any thoughts on how you score environmentally cradle to grave uh, hydrogen energy? Yes, thank you so much for the question. And we do have quite a bit of effort also coordinating internationally. We're a co-lead of international partnerships over 20 countries, so developing common methodology, also looking at, for instance, dig ones policies, how do we use existing conduits, try to minimize the risk. And with our national labs, we have consortia High Blend and uh, HMAT Materials Consortium to help, again, identify how do we reduce the risk uh, um, appropriate materials for the pipeline. So, so right now, do you have a cradle to grave environmental score for hydrogen energy? Uh, right now, again, as we look at bipartisan infrastructure law, we'd be looking at those types of criteria. If, if you have some data that could show me the environmental impact cradle to grave of hydrogen energy, how you're going to measure this going forward, I'd love to see it. Not just the carbon score, but the environmental footprint. Yes, we've already started looking at sustainability screening tools and Happy to follow up with you. But you've got data now to, that I can look at? Uh, well, we have uh, various analyses. I think the validation will be really important. We'll get the data as we look at the hubs and the build out. We don't have sufficient scale yet. Okay, thank you. I yield back. Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's nice to see you in that, in that seat. I compliment you on your meteoric rise. Uh, I think there are a couple of general points. Number one, this is a very important hearing. Number two, a, a, a general point is research is key. We've just got to keep investing in research, and that's where the federal government can play an important role. As we all know, the shale gas revolution started with Department of Energy support for basic research that George Mitchell then used to develop uh, the, the fracking technology. So. Uh, the the investment by uh, by the federal government by the Department of Energy I think is is absolutely critical. Uh, number two, in response to Senator Marshall, I completely agree. We we need uh, cradle to grave analysis. One issue on the blue hydrogen analysis that I think we have to bear in mind is not only the the methane and and other costs at the at production point, but the upstream uh, methane that's released now in uh, production and transportation. That's got to be a major concern. As you all know, methane is 80 times more potent as a greenhouse gas and CO2. So I, I think that's something when we're th talking about blue hydrogen and assessing environmental costs, we've got to talk about fugitive emissions upstream until we get those under control. Um, 
I'm a huge believer in renewables, in, in solar and wind. On the other hand, I'm also a huge believer in reality. And right now, I just checked in New England, about 7% uh, of our electricity is being generated by solar and wind. Uh, in order to achieve a fully decarbonized economy through renewables, in other words, we'd have to have almost, we'd have to have 10 times the solar and wind capacity that we currently have. That's a big deal. I mean, as you drive around Maine, you see a lot of big solar farms now, and uh, the, the the idea of multiplying it by 10 is something you know we, we got to think about because we're going to have to overbuild solar and wind in order to produce the excess energy to store, whether it's hydrogen batteries or others. So you, 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 we have to have 100% uh, uh, capacity. A uh, cu couple of specific questions. Uh, Mr. Graff, are we going to see a cost curve on electrolyzers that's equivalent to what's happened with solar and wind over the last 10 years? Senator, there's, there's a lot of work and a lot of effort right now to work on electrolysis and the cost produced by electrolysis clearly with the support of DOE and some of the programs and research ongoing there, along with the incentivization of the Clean Hydrogen Production Act to further build its scale and start to demonstrate how this can work. So we will see that pathway. We will see it evolve. It will take a while with that research and that effort and to build its scale to get it down to parity with the production costs of hydrogen as we know today without carbon capture. Right. And, and, and even, it's also going to be competing with batteries and pump storage and all the other storage technologies. It, it definitely will. And, and I think as all of these elements grow, which I think we certainly need to go ahead and reinforce and grow simultaneously to achieve our needs, as we electrify everything from the grid standpoint, we've also got to look at the infrastructure there and how we source that and what we do. And that's why I think, to your point, if we're going to use solar and we're going to use wind, uh, we do not only need to produce excess, but we also need to store it. And I mentioned before what we can do with a storage cavern to make that work as well. Uh, uh, one, one question, a quick technical question. You talked about trucks and using this. Isn't hydrogen significantly less dense in terms of energy than gasoline? And How big a tank would you need on a truck to get uh, 200 miles or 300 miles of so it is, it is definitely less dense, but you are not utilizing it in an internal combustion engine. So it is far more efficient in its delivery of power to go ahead and drive the vehicle. Would it be delivered to, a, to an electric motor? Is that the, that's so, the technology? We're talking about a fuel cell, effectively. Exactly. Basically, they're, they're all electric vehicles. It's right. just a question of do I have a battery that I charge from the grid? Right. Or do I actually produce the, produce the power on board? And, but, the, but a fuel cell that would give a truck significant mileage is, wouldn't be as big as the truck, is what I'm asking. No, no. It would definitely be small enough that it would be comparable to what we have today. And it would be leveraged in a way that you would be in a place where you would maintain the usability of, of that freight capability. And, and utilize the uh, the full capacity of those trucks and those vehicles. And, and, and I may follow up with you in questions for the record because I'm running out of time on sure. on uh, pressure, temperature, practicality of storage, transportation, those kinds of things. Mr. Levinka, quick question: uh, If you have a wind project, is there a potential here for a sort of a package project where you have a wind project and then you have electric? electrolyzer on site because if you, when you have a wind project by definition you have the transmission system you got the wires already there so you don't have to transport you could make the uh, make the hydrogen right on the site have a generator based upon the hydrogen on the site so you have a essentially a baseload plant is that a feasible uh, engineering concept Yes, sir, and thank you for the question, Senator. Uh, it definitely is, and it's a concept that we're currently putting into practice through the Wyoming project that I mentioned earlier. Um, I would say the taking that power and making it into hydrogen and then moving it long distances is much more efficient than moving it on a wire long distances in terms of energy losses. And so really the question comes down to where is the end use, where is the end market for that molecule, and that would kind of dictate what's the best uh, Sure, outcome. You, you've got line losses, but if it's, if it's going into the local grid, then that isn't a t terribly significant factor as opposed to pipeline and the infrastructure 
uh, development. Agreed. And I guess what I would say is typically when it comes to wind and large scale wind and solar, um, they're not usually located next to or adjacent to large power demand. Right. And so that that's really our approach is to find where is the demand. So your your project would be wind electrolyzer hydrogen pipeline. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What happened to What happened to Langford? We, we sent him out. Uh, Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Time was up. <laughs> uh, Senator King, I always love listening to your questions because it's just such a free range of, of exploratory ideas. So thank you for that. Um, good hearing this morning, and I, I'm I'm sorry that I I missed. Your, your, your testimony, um, as you provided here to the committee, I read, uh, I read what you had submitted. And again, this is an area where we think we have great, great promise. Um, I note that uh, the department just today, or maybe I guess it was, yeah, last night, um, is announcing some restructuring to help facilitate and streamline the uh, the implementation under the bipartisan infrastructure law, which is um, good and I think notable and, and certainly timely. A question for you, Dr. Uh, Satchapal. Has, has the Department of Energy identified any regions that it believes would be suitable for a hydrogen hub? This is, this is the criteria that we had outlined in, in the infrastructure uh, Jobs Act. I've, I have received um, two letters, actually, from our governor. Uh, one was directed, actually, to you, Mr. Chairman. The other one was directed to Secretary Granholm, uh, talking about Alaska's clean hydrogen potential, outlining the substantial resources that we have, uh, uh, really superlative sequestration basin, um, access to, uh, to, to certainly the Asia markets there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit uh, these letters for the record from our governor that highlights these potentials. But Without objection. Thank you. But ask you directly, uh, Dr. Sachapal, what work has been done to identify these regions? Um, uh, is Alaska being considered? Can you tell me where you are with that? Thank you so much, um, Senator Murkowski. It's Honor to meet you, and we have done significant analysis. We have three reports that have been published looking regionally at resources. We had announced uh, just today, I mentioned before you came in, that we'll be issuing two uh, requests for information to get more feedback. And we also launched a tool, H2 Matchmaker, which is public, which will allow producers and users to identify themselves. Um, so there's significant activity uh, underway. And I should just mention that um, my sister office, the Arctic office, as you may know, we're planning a workshop on hydrogen in your state, and Great. your governor has been engaged. So really look forward to engaging. Great. Well, uh, again, I would, I would hope that some of the attributes that the governor has mentioned would certainly be, be considered as you're making those determinations. Um, uh, continuing with you, can you share what the administration's policy is uh, with regards to converting natural gas to hydrogen? Um, there, we recognize that there are some um, within the administration, certainly some groups that, that may have influence uh, on the administration, who are, are very, um, uh, very firm about not using fuel sources like natural gas. So the question is, is, is there a role for conversion to play, and, and what might we uh, anticipate with regards to support and funding that might come with it? Thank you again for the question. And as mentioned, with hydrogen shot, we're really looking at all of the pathways. It's really about clean hydrogen. So whether it's natural gas, um, carbon feedstocks, nuclear, renewables, you know, any pathway to get to the, the low carbon intensity, we're really pivoting away from the colors. There's a lot of complexity, right. green, blue, purple, turquoise. Uh, pyrolysis is another approach. In fact, our loan program office just announced financing of $1 billion. Um, Solid carbon, which is another value-added product, you, no need for the, the CCS portion. So definitely in all of the above 
strategies needed to meet all of our goals. And that sounds like it certainly includes natural gas. So uh, this may be to, uh, again, directed to you, uh, Dr. Sachapal, or, or perhaps Mr. Lewis. Um, but again, I'm, I'm focusing on the enormous potential that we see for um, uh, in Alaska with, with hydrogen. Um, in particularly, we're looking at ways to decarbonize our, our fishing industry. We have a strong commercial fishing industry. Um, uh, we have commercial marine navigation. Uh, we have transportation marine fleets. Can, can either of you speak to the feasibility of utilizing hydrogen as a clean source of propulsion for our ships, and whether or not you're aware of any work that's being done uh, with regards to commercialization of technology. I'm asked when I'm back home what the prospects might be, and if, if either of you could speak to that. Um, yes, I'm pleased to say that we actually have a project, first of its kind, first uh, ferry, hydrogen ferry in the Western Hemisphere. Um, we are funding an electrolyzer on the pier that would actually refuel the ferry, and then also a fuel cell. So once we generate electric power, we'll also be able to charge a battery electric vessel. And we're coordinating internationally as well. There's significant activity. Where are you doing this with the, with the ferry pilot? Um, the, the current project that... Um, applied and was selected will be in, in California. Because we have a, uh, I think, a very unique marine highway system. And um, uh, again, something interesting to explore. Mr. Lewis, did you have anything further that you wanted to add? Yeah, in addition to the great work that's being done on uh, hydrogen fuel cell propulsion for marine vessels, another way of um, accessing hydrogen energy is through ammonia. And ammonia-powered internal combustion engines are being developed for long haul transoceanic shipping and may be um, quite useful for um, uh, deep sea fishing. And so there's a lot of work being done on, um, on that front, mainly for um, container and freight ships, but I think there's going to be a lot of learning that will be also be applicable to long haul fishing. So just a point of clarification on that, do you think that ammonia would be easier to do when it comes to uh, to the commercial fishing? In the um, in freight vessel applications, we think it will be because you can store the ammonia energy um, more readily than you can store enough hydrogen to get you across an ocean, for example. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very interesting. Uh, Senator Rono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Lewis, Hawaii has a goal of reaching a 100% carbon neutral economy by 2045. Right. I think we have the most uh, ambitious standards in that regard. As islands, Hawaii is highly dependent on marine shipping. You described in your testimony the potential for hydrogen or hydrogen-based ammonia to serve as a low carbon fuel in long distance marine shipping. What are the next steps that companies and the federal government need to take to determine the usefulness of low carbon hydrogen in marine shipping? We'd love to see Lewis? more commercial demonstrations. And I'm sorry? I said we, we would love Could to get see- a little closer to the mic, please? Yep, sorry or about move, that. Move the mic. Thank you. Apologies, and thank you for the question. Um, we'd love to see more commercial demonstrations. We've been um, working with the marine industry to uh, encourage and promote the development of hydrogen-based shipping for several years now. And um, the deployment period is, you know, typically still a year or two away. But we're getting to the point where there are companies that are saying that um, deployment of clean ammonia-fueled vessels um, should be in the water next year. There's a company in, a mining company in Australia that expects to deploy an ammonia-powered um, freight vessel uh, by the end of this year. And so we're getting to the point where um, it's becoming a viable commercial option. Um, we'd love to see more support, though, to demonstrate that uh, technology and to test that technology. There are still key questions about using ammonia as fuel that need to be answered. Well, when you say that you would love to see more support, what kind of support? Um, investments in pilot demonstration projects. Um, investments in um, the development of ammonia bunkering systems at key ports around the world, particularly in the United States. 
Did you say you've been working with some private companies? We have, yes. To uh, have them. Uh, and is Matson one of those companies? We have not been working with them. Mainly the, the, one of the efforts that we're involved in that we're most excited about is actually working with retail companies that are the cargo owners, um, companies that move their goods from production uh, regions of the world to, um, to places like the United States. And what we've, um, many of those companies have uh, corporate-wide decarbonization goals. And um, to reach those goals, they need the scope three emissions from the shipping to be eliminated. And so we're working with those companies through an effort called the Cargo Owners for Zero Emission Vessels, or COZEV, to uh, set, to signal demand to the market for zero carbon shipping. And so that, um, the COZEV effort, which includes companies like, um, uh, like Amazon, uh, Patagonia, mm. Ikea, mm -hmm. are, are, are coming together and trying to figure out how to, um, how to communicate that demand to the market and uh, look forward to engaging no. with cargo owners, I mean, sorry, with, with, with cargo vessels to provide zero carbon shipping. So you don't do that, that much with the, mar the marine shipping side of shipping? With the, the, the carrier companies? Yeah, yes. We've yet to engage closely with the carrier companies. No, that's not true. I'm sorry. We, we have worked with Maersk a little bit to understand what they're doing, and they're doing quite a bit. Hmm. Um, Next question is for uh, uh, Mr. Satya Paul. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your, your last name. Again, we, we have a goal in Hawaii of 100% renewable power by 2045, and Hawaii's biggest utility, Hawaiian Electric, has identified green hydrogen made with renewable power as one potential source for achieving Hawaii's goal of 100% renewable power. Hydrogen would serve as a way to store renewable power for later use to complement the, the variability of solar and wind power. The bipartisan infrastructure bill includes $1 billion for the demonstration, commercialization, and deployment of electrolyzer systems. Doctor, could you elaborate on how you plan to use the infrastructure bill funding to develop hydrogen from renewable power and how uh, then, determine, then determine how it could be used to help uh, use higher levels of renewable power? Thank you so much, Senator, for the question. And if I may also just mention, we have projects in your state mm -hmm. related to the marine. In fact, we demonstrated the world's first uh, pure side fuel cell instead of a diesel generator to um, power vessels along with the Maritime Administration and also have other activities, shipping mission, ammonia, liquid fuels, hydrogen electrification, and all of the above portfolio. And then Thank I you. mentioned before yeah. you came in that we plan, we're very excited um, to announce that we plan to release two requests for information to solicit feedback. We already have a very comprehensive ele electrolysis program, cut the cost 60, 80% already. We still need much more durability, efficiency. So again, we have a, a pretty comprehensive effort and really appreciate the bipartisan infrastructure law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm. Senator Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, great that we're having this hearing on uh, clean hydrogen and uh, hydrogen fuel cells. Um, it's way, the way we generate our electricity aboard the space shuttle. So I've got a little operational experience um, with these. Um, Dr. Uh, Satyapal, um, Thank you for testifying today. Uh, the Department of Energy has a tremendous opportunity that I don't want uh, overlooked in today's hearing. In the Southwest, we can produce and transport substantial amounts of clean hydrogen. For starters, our solar potential is uh, exceptional. And we have the Palo Verde generating station, which is the largest nuclear power plant in the country that's producing hydrogen by electrolysis. So we've got the energy capacity to be uh, well involved here. And then the I-10 and I-40 corridors are perfectly situated to transport hydrogen from the East Coast and Rocky Mountain states into California and then even overseas. And New Mexico is expanding their carbon capture and storage capacity. Arizona and New Mexico are looking into the $8 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure 
law for the development of clean hydrogen hubs across the U.S. If the Department of Energy designates the Southwest as a hydrogen hub, it would help the country meet our climate goals. Uh, it would also provide badly needed jobs for the Navajo Nation, uh, which is the largest indigenous population in the country. Hundreds of Navajo workers have been displaced as coal plants on the Navajo Nation began to shut down. And the Navajo government is looking at hydrogen as a way to build their economy. Uh, so, Dr. Satyapal, um, the bipartisan infrastructure law directs DOE, DOE to establish at least four hydrogen hubs. Would you estimate there's a need for more than just four hydrogen hubs? Thank you so much, Senator. And I should just mention that before I joined DOE 18 years ago, the company I worked for, every American manned space mission used our fuel cells. So Great. it's an honor. In fact, I brought a uh, sample here. <laughs> um, but I think, and as you know, only water is a, a product. Uh, astronauts can even drink that water. So Well, we wind up with so much water from these fuel cells. <laughs> We've got to dump it overboard. I mean, we'll transfer some of it to the space station, but if we're not docked to the space station, our fuel cells generate electricity, and they also, you know, we wind up with heat and water, and the water we have to, there's so much of it we got to dump overboard. So that's, and that's actually a good thing. Yep. So. And again, going back to the, the leadership uh, issue that the committee has raised, going back to the Gemini, the Apollo, the United States was the leader in hydrogen and fuel cells. So again, really appreciate the interest. And as I mentioned before you came in, we'll be issuing a request for information um, on really getting feedback from the communities, um, all the stakeholders on you know how best to, to implement the bipartisan infrastructure law, including the bill and then the other, the, the hubs and the other provisions. And I do want to mention that we did uh, also just award um, 20 million, um, which will use the Palo Verde uh, nuclear power. And going back to Senator King's question, really to avoid, um, we really can't uh, avoid stranded assets. So if you're gonna have uh, intermittent renewables, uh, solar, wind, uh, one of the concepts is a hybrid system where you come in with baseload nuclear so that you have higher utilization of the electrolyzer and that's what will help us to get the cost down as well. So again, it's very comp complex, and those hybrid approaches, again, we're really excited. We have five uh, nuclear hydrogen projects, and this one was, was just announced as well. So uh, wanted to highlight again the value of these, these demonstrations, these pilot demonstrations, and they will help to ensure that the hubs and the next generation of deployments will really be um, you know, market successful and sustainable. So thank you. Do you think we need more than four? We will definitely look forward to the feedback from stakeholders and um, as we design the most effective strategies. And then I have one request if you um, and the Department of Energy would engage in uh, some tribal consultation as uh, we develop this hydrogen hub initiative, because this could be a, a real benefit uh, to the Navajo Nation. Yes, and our Office of Indian Energy has already spoken with the Navajo Nation, and in Section 815, it also specifically mentions engaging tribal um, Native Hawaiian, and so again, we look, look forward to, to coordinating. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Um, that wraps up our first round of questioning. Uh, we're going to have to be going to vote, but let me just thank you all for your... Uh, for your wonderful testimony and participating in this panel, which is extremely, extremely informative. I'd like to say just one thing. I think on behalf of all of us have an interest in these hydrogen hubs, uh, and I think you've made abundantly clear where the hydrogen economy can go. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all could comment on, if you were in a state that's trying to secure a hydrogen hub, if you were in a state that was trying to secure a hydrogen hub, what would you recommend would be the, the selling point of your state that you would like to see or like make sure people know that what you would have and how you would submit your application that be, could be of help? You can start, okay, Mr. Lang? Sure. Thank you for the question, Senator. Um, I, I would say we're looking at multiple hub opportunities, um, but specifically uh, we're a company based in Oklahoma. I think Oklahoma has a lot of fantastic attributes that fit the criteria for, for the hub. Um, you have a great wind resource, you have a great natural gas resource, you have a great 
existing infrastructure to, to leverage. You also have proximity to the transportation hubs, that the corridors for moving large vehicles east and west across the United States, and proximity to the Gulf Coast. And so um, you put all those together, I think it's a great fit. Uh, checks a lot of the criteria boxes that have been asked for in, in the hubs. Mr. Graff, what, what, I, I what, are, you, what are you looking for to move one in? So, so, Senator, we're in all 50 states, so we're already active in, in every state in, in many respects. And I would build on, on, on Brian's comment, and, and I think that in addition to that, I think another benefit of a hydrogen hub uh, is not just the ecosystem that's available in terms of the energy resources and how we would manage that, but how do we integrate this among different users? Is there a way to integrate this capability into industry into transportation, into power as appropriate. We see this happening in other parts of the world where you see the beginnings of infrastructure being built that is able to be leveraged into multiple needs in multiple places. And, and they would look at it at a basin or a hub type concept for themselves in order to do that. So I think we would look at all of those things in any state and look for the opportunities of working with that state or that group of states to make that work. Mr. Lewis, you have any comments? Yes, thank you. Uh, we think that the attributes of a good hub in general are lots of potential off-takers for hydrogen, like major truck depots, ports, and industrial facilities, uh, opportunities for strong public engagement, and a commitment to delivering near-term environmental benefits such as reductions in diesel emissions. At a natural gas-based production hub, we think that there needs to be a supply of affordable natural gas, of course, uh, good access to high-quality carbon sequestration reservoirs, and a strong system in place for detecting and eliminating methane leaks from the gas production and transport infrastructure. And if it's an electrolytic production hub, we'd like to see, obviously, a surplus of renewable energy or a surplus of nuclear energy or both. Sure. Uh, well, I represent one of those states, and my advice would just be everybody else just give up and, and let us win. No, but the, in seriousness, I think it's more about a diversity of fuel source, so renewables plus uh, others as well, uh, with their hydrocarbons and nuclear and the critical piece is, of course, uh, the value chain integration. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all well and good if you can produce a lot of hydrogen. You have to have offtake as well. So integrating with uh, demand centers. And doctor? Um, I'll just say that we've spent significant amount of effort um, looking at you know, how best uh, to implement and both strategically, tact, um, you know, tactically. And so again, we really look forward to working with all of you, all of the stakeholders, uh, to design the best um, possible approach. So thank you. Well, let me just say you all whetted everybody's appetite as far as why we should be moving to something that we can do in America. We don't have to depend on our foreign supply chains to continue to transform and transition into a clean energy technology and energy climate and environment. So we appreciate very much. And with that, Senator Langford. Mr. Chairman, y'all, thanks. This has been extremely helpful. I'll be able to walk through all the issues with hydrogen today. And I appreciate all the engagement on this. I, I do want to drill down on the transition. Uh, we've talked about possibilities, but this panel knows extremely well. Uh, this conversation about hydrogen being the next thing has been the conversation for about 25 years. And so there's a lot of dialogue about how does that transition actually happen? How do we get down to efficiency? So I've got some questions on that portion of it. Uh, Mr. Levinka, thanks again for your testimony and your work in this area. The existing natural gas pipeline covers the entire country. As uh, Dr. Sotopal uh, mentioned earlier, we've got about 1,600 miles of hydrogen pipeline. That's not close to what would actually be needed. What do you see as the transition for moving hydrogen? It's, we're, we're not going to put it on a truck and drive it around. That's not going to be efficient. What is going to be needed? What do you see as that transition uh, for the existing natural gas pipeline structure? Yeah. Thank you, Senator Langford. I, I would say that's really why we're so interested in hydrogen. We think the ability to utilize the existing infrastructure that really covers the entire lower 48 is incredibly important. Um, we're doing near-term blending projects to start proving that concept out. As part of our testimony, we submitted a report from the Pipeline Research Council International that talks about what is the state of existing natural gas infrastructure, how much can we blend now, and what needs to be done, what do we need to address to continue to move that blend higher. So we're very excited about that. We've got near-term projects to go prove that and show what our asset base can do. Okay, so when you when you talk about Excuse blending... Me, so I'm but, confused. Can you put hydrogen in a pipeline with natural gas? That's exactly where I was going next on this, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, Senator, that, that's exactly right. So the, the idea would be to blend hydrogen into the existing natural gas infrastructure uh, to create a, a decarbonized product moving forward. So you're talking something equivalent what we knew and talk about all the time about gasoline being mixed with ethanol to be able to deliver that and that product be burned the same way, but having a mixture of natural gas and of hydrogen and that being an initial way to be able to use existing infrastructure to feed hydrogen into the line and have a blend at the other end. So it reduces the carbon footprint, but it's not not total hydrogen. That's exactly right. So just, just to clarify as well, I would assume there's not a day where we're all natural gas in this pipeline and then on Thursday and then Friday it's all hydrogen the next day. Orifices would have to be different to burn it. To, uh, everything on the other end of it in the delivery has to be different to be able to handle hydrogen than they do handling methane on that. What do you see as a transition? And my next question is going to be the regulatory side of that. Are there regulatory barriers this committee needs to know if we're going to move hydrogen? Is that a different regulatory issue than moving natural gas? What are we facing? Yeah, great question, Senator. So I'll, I'll start with the downstream impacts that you mentioned. It's definitely a, a key part of our analysis is understanding today's natural gas users, how would a hydrogen blend impact them? Um, the challenge around that is that the natural, natural gas infrastructure touches a lot of different end users. It's liquefied natural gas, it's power generation, it's utilities that are, that are ultimately sending gas to local distribution companies to go to your home. So there are a number of downstream impacts that we want to make sure we understand and that we can address so that we can continue to safely and efficiently operate our existing business without jeopardizing that uh, moving forward. It, in terms of the, the regulatory side of things, uh, we, we believe that there are challenges now about building any kind of infrastructure. Uh, we think that if we want to continue to grow a clean hydrogen economy, it's going to take incremental infrastructure that today can be built for natural gas that tomorrow could be used for hydrogen. Sure. And so uh, we will look for continued support around permitting, around the ability to build out infrastructure that's needed for the future. Let, let me ask, if, if I can jump go, in go just one it, yeah. second. Let me ask, uh, and put this in, into comparison, uh, ethanol with gasoline. You go to the pump, 10%, could be as much as 10% ethanol blend. Okay. Some people says, I want nothing with ethanol blend because of the water in it basically harms my engine, especially in uh, marine, marine life. Okay, you know that. So I'm able to still have a clean source of, of gasoline without ethanol. You don't know if blending has the same effect in hydrogen blended with natural gas coming in the same pipeline would have a detriment to the using it in your household heat that basically is delivered through the natural gas pipelines or any other use of the natural gas. We haven't gotten that far with it to know what the effects may be. Is that what you're saying? Senator, there, there are studies going on now to address that question of what, what would be the, the percentages where you would start to have those concerns and how would you address that? Gotcha. Them? So we're, we're, we're not down there yet, but we're getting there. And that, I, I, I know, doctor, I, I want to hear from you from the research end of it. But, but, it's a, but it's the same issue, really, to be able to, with ethanol, because yeah. hydrogen is, also does not burn as hot as methane does. Is that correct? So the British thermal units on methane is higher than it is for hydrogen. So same for gasoline and for ethanol. Correct. Your ethanol is not as fuel efficient as gasoline so we, is. So that, that's also a factor. Is, am I correct or not correct on that? Yes, uh, you're correct. Doctor? Dr. Shepman, side of Paul. Oh. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, just to add, uh, you know, in agreement there, there are many studies ongoing. So uh, general um, con consensus so far is maybe about 5 to 15 percent blends may be appropriate. Depends on the materials of the pipeline. You can have embrittlements and issues. And you're um, exactly right, the end use applications, the burners, there may be some modification. The UK is looking, in fact, at, you know, completely um, 100 percent hydrogen as some of their pilots in uh, some cities were coordinating internationally. We also have uh, an initiative called High Blend. There are now over 40 companies, along with our um, other consortium, to look exactly at what types of materials should be used. Um, the, the flame is actually hotter with hydrogen. Um, but again, the, what I was going to mention is I was in Germany about four years ago, the world's largest at the time, wind to hydrogen plant. It was six megawatts. Now they're substantially larger. But, and they were injecting 10%. That was the blending limit uh, into the natural gas pipeline for three years. And so there were no issues. And so there, in terms of um, 
looking at our, our safety codes and standards subprogram, our R&D is really helping to inform the right codes and standards, having the right uh, injection standard, both in terms of the pipelines. And so we're working with um, DOT, the, the Pipeline Hazardous Material Safety um, Authority that regulates uh, safety of pipelines, and uh, also you know, really informing what should those li limits be. So really appreciate that question. Yeah. Yeah, okay, that, Mr. Kraft. I know we're short on time, so I'll be very brief just to add to the comments. I think it's clear that there's a lot of effort underway, as has been said, to look at what you can blend in an existing pipeline system. But you're going to be limited as to what you can do, 10% or whatever the case may be, and a lot of work is going on on that. I don't know whether that ends up. We operate some of those pipelines of pure hydrogen today, mm -hmm. and, and they are constructed with a totally different metallurgy. They are constructed with different types of fittings and different types of operations and are really point to point for those that actually need that for a specific purpose so that you avoid some of these other issues. So I'd be happy to follow up on that. Another point is when you get to a very high purity, another port or part of use is not just the BTUs, but it's also the fact that hydrogen burns totally clean. You can't see it when it burns. And so you reach a point where fire eyes and other things no longer work. The final point I'll make is that we see the opportunity to build more localization of facilities so that you aren't having to ship across great distances. Because each ecosystem may have the availability, as we spoke of before, for renewable power to generate uh, hydrogen with electrolysis, to produce it with natural gas and capture the carbon. And you are able to reduce the transportation footprint and actually provide jobs in that locality that are very good jobs. Let me yeah, ask you, uh, is, is there any experiments in basically blending hydrogen into uh, coal-fired units uh, in, in the boilers? We've been able to reduce the NOx in there. Can we do the same thing by inducing hydrogen to reduce the emissions? Anybody? Uh, do you know if we've done that? I don't think it's happened in the United States, but Japan is um, pursuing that. So Japan's pursuing adding ni uh, hydrogen into their... Coal-fired units. What they're, they're the idea is well, th what they're what they're testing is introducing ammonia as hydrogen gotcha, carrier gotcha, into gotcha. the coal-fired okay. boiler. If you get whenever you get any results, please pass them on. I, we'll I, look for them also. I do want to come back to Mr. Levinka on the on the regulatory side as well, and then I've got one other question just on distribution network. Then we'll wrap it up. Is that all right? Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Let's do it. So the regulatory side. You were halfway through that question before the chairman appropriately interrupted. Uh, but the, 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 the challenge that we have in this committee is trying to be able to determine what, what, are, the, what are the issues that are going to come at us that literally we've got to resolve around this dias if we're going to actually move forward on hydrogen. And I, my perception is if there's not clarity on the regulatory issue of who's handling the pipeline, who's permitting it, if we end up blending fuels like this, does that change the regulator on it? All of those issues that are out there that we need to know if there's something that y'all know at this point that we've got to deal with statutorily. Sure. Uh, great question, Senator. And so I, I would say we're asking those same questions now, and I think the regulators are trying to, to figure out where their scope starts and stops. Um, specifically, when we think about natural gas blending, um, we deal with FERC on a natural gas uh, on the NGA side of it. And so um, how much of a blend does that stop being a natural gas pipeline and start being a hydrogen pipeline? Who's going to regulate that? Those are questions that we're trying to get answered. Uh, we need that clarity to be confident in our investment and confident moving forward in these things. And so well, it, if at some point the regulators aren't clear on that, obviously we've got to make clarity on that to be able to provide statutory clarity and to be able to say, you don't have to guess because that could change from administration to administration. That doesn't provide stability and investment. We're not going to get capital coming to the market if people don't really know where the investment is on this. My last comment was um, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, multiple different trucking uh, companies basically that handle the fuel, uh, the trucking truck stops, they started investing into natural gas, getting into their spot. So when the transition happened for heavy vehicles, went to natural gas, they'd be ready to be able to sell fuel. Now, a lot of those have million dollar investments sitting at a station that's not used because the federal government was going to push towards natural gas for heavy trucking. I would assume those same truck stops are going to pause significantly before they start moving to hydrogen or electricity to charge batteries or whatever it may be because they just got, excuse the pun, burned 10 years ago by investing millions of dollars into what the federal government told them what's happening and where it's going next. How do we 
avoid that same thing again? And how do we get those companies to say, okay, this is really the investment without basically the federal taxpayer doing that? Because that was private investment that did all the natural gas stuff. Now we're talking about either federal grants doing it and the taxpayer having to be able to pay for that yeah. mistake or something yeah. else. Yeah, or loans or whatever it may be. So how, how do we get to a point where there's some certainty in it so we don't have that same mistake again? <laughs> there's not much of an answer to that one because the federal government will either jump in. I, I've been pushing back on, I, I said this is simple, that I never recall reading the history books the United States government built filling stations when Henry Ford invented the Model T. We just didn't do it. The market usually jumped in and did it. The market's skittish right now because yeah. of what they, that's what he's saying. We will, we will prime the pump. It'll be some very attractive low interest loans, no interest loans, trying to get these markets primed up. But it's, it's going to be a, a money source sooner or later. And, and the federal government and the taxpayer and the, and, and, the, and the treasury should not be left holding the bag. Great. But I'm willing to wait five or 10 years to get that back just at our cost. That's all. So I think that would be enough without you all putting your capital in jeopardy right now. That's what we're hoping will happen. Yeah, I would agree. I don't think the federal taxpayer should be involved in that, but that's yeah. that's one of those challenges out there. R&D is one thing. Distribution is in something entirely different. But we've got to win some folks over that are still ticked. Let me thank you all again. We, I know you've been very, very kind with your time, and, and we appreciate you making the effort to be here, and it's been very, very helpful. Members are going to have until the close of business tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record.